Rolling. Son of a bitch, you set me up. I have so much joy in my heart right now. Why is that? We're talking The Office. Season 6. Ooh, that's right. So before we get into it, I will remind everybody they can interact with us on Twitter at CTS Terry or by searching the Catch the Sky podcast on Facebook or Twitter. So what happens in Season 6? We got 26 episodes. There's a lot to dig into, right? The biggest narrative, Jim and Pam get married. They finally tie the knot in Viagra Falls. What happens in Niagara stays in Niagara. They also crap out a baby in season six, which I was really, that was a fun episode. Yeah, that happens over the course of two episodes as well. And Jim gets promoted to co-manager of Dunder Mifflin. Yeah, right. Two guys doing one job. Which is soon to become Sabre. (laughs) Don't you mean Sabre? (laughs) <laughs> what blows my mind about that whole thing is that the buffalo sabers play in buffalo new york which is only a state away so there should really be no excuse for them mispronouncing saber i recall you and i driving by that stadium on our way to niagara falls that's right it all comes together <laughs> And so we find out that Dunder Mifflin is going under this season, and this results in some of the higher-ups being let go, including our friend David Wallace, who is beside himself trying to find his next career path. He thinks he's onto something with the suck it, though. And what's interesting is when Michael stops over to seek his advice, we see him drinking a yingling, which I brought some of on our most recent excursion out there. It's all gone. So I drank it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I can see why David chose it. But it's a nice touch because that is a local Pennsylvania beer that is starting to branch out nationwide, but for the last 10 or so years has only been available in Pennsylvania and parts of Florida, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes. I think it was the – It's Yingling is available in the original 13 colonies and Florida. <laughs> can't recall if the hanging dong of America <laughs> you can buy. I know I drank it there when I was in St. Pete last time. A year ago, actually. That's right, because you sent me a postcard from there. So let's get into some of our favorite episodes. I think you mentioned that Jim and Pam get married. How can that not be included in our favorite episodes for this season? Honestly, when I rewatch The Office over and over and over and over and over again, I stop at Niagara Falls and I'm done. And then I'll... I'll start from the beginning again, because I think this is where the show should end. It really is the highlight of arguably the series. It's the most important wedding to Dunder Mifflin, pending Michaels. And it starts off with a bang with Pam puking in the garbage can. (laughs) That episode is fucking great. So Pam is obviously pregnant still and doesn't want anybody to give that away because her grandmother doesn't know. Mima. Yeah, and she might be offended. Decent people everywhere might be offended. (laughs) You're lucky to have her. (laughs) Some of us have to be our own grandmothers. (laughs) So, as you said, Pam is experiencing some morning sickness and asks everybody if they could put their stinky stuff away. Dwight obviously refuses, pulls out the hard-boiled egg, causes her to get sick, and this creates a domino effect throughout the office, and people are puking everywhere. It's awful. If I smell puke, I throw up or want to throw up immediately. Yeah, I'm not usually the same. (laughs) Unless it's already my own and I'm in the motions of doing so, and then I smell it, I'm like, oh, that just came out of me. Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) I don't usually puke unless I've drank way too much way too fast 
and that doesn't happen too often. So I've gotten pretty good at taking things in moderation. Michael's ready to go for this whole wedding, though. He's strapped, it looks like, a 24-pack to the back of his car. And as he's pulling out of the parking lot, they're exploding everywhere. He didn't empty them. <laughs> and it's supposed to go on the back of the bride and groom's car. He's got the whole thing backwards. But it's just the primer that we need for this episode. So he drives him and Dwight up to Niagara Falls, falling asleep while driving along the way. He's wearing some very dark sunglasses. Looks like I could have used those last time I was out in Arizona. I forgot mine. <laughs> did your Stormtrooper glasses break? One pair did, but that's why I bought like four pair. Gotcha. So Michael gets to Niagara Falls and tries to reserve a room in the Beasley Halbert block of rooms. For some reason, he didn't make a reservation in advance and finds himself begging everyone if he can stay in their room, which leads to, you call me midweek with this, and you <laughs> lost your mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's like the best two minutes of writing in the show. Like you said, this season, they should have just ended it because they were on fire. Michael starts by asking Dwight if he can stay with him and says that he would do the same if the tables were turned. Well, Dwight switches it around on him. And says, oh, this reservation is for an M. Scott. Michael quickly snatches it up. <laughs> and Dwight says, well, I have to stay with you. And Michael says, well, if I have a girl over and it's getting romantic, I don't want her to get turned off by you brushing your teeth with clay and butter. <laughs> 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 so Michael Which, fails yeah. <laughs> Dwight's dungeon wisdom test and goes to Stanley. <laughs> So he asks Stanley if he could stay with him and Cynthia, not his wife. And Stanley says that they only have one bed. And Michael's like, you got to be kidding me. A queen size bed is five feet wide. I'm not five feet wide, Michael. I'm not a physics major, <laughs> Stanley. I'm just saying, be careful. <laughs> and then he proceeds to ask Aaron and Kelly if he could stay with them. Their responses are, ew, gross. I'd rather blow my brains out. Okay, rude. <laughs> And then Toby offers him a bed. And Michael's response is, you're going to be sleeping by yourself for the rest of your life, so you should just get used to it. <laughs> Michael does end up staying near the vending machines and the ice machines. And the <laughs> ice machine gets a lot of use as it gets used as an ironing board. It gets used to cool off Kevin's feet. And that's all because Kevin has to wear Kleenex boxes as shoes because his were incinerated after the shoe shine was almost sent to the freaking hospital or something upon smelling them. Yeah, passed out. <laughs> it's a safety issue. <laughs> yeah, right. So match that with his hairpiece that he also wears. By the way, he's not wearing it the previous night when they're at the dinner doing all the toasts and stuff. So... Everybody already knows that he doesn't have hair that's at the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> but by the end, his his dogs are barking, so he's got to put them in the ice machine to cool them down. Right. And Michael does end up finding a room with Pam's mom, Helene. That's right. After the wedding, he gets to stay with yeah. Pam's mom. And they end up briefly dating for a couple of episodes afterwards, which makes for some great back and forth between Michael, Jim, and Pam. <laughs> I love when, when they Jim finds out that Michael is dating Helene. <laughs> Specifically, he describes her green Camry. Yeah, and the seats go all the way down. <laughs> and Jim just curses as soon as Toby walks in and tries to say hello. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not now, man. They just pounce on him. But no, Michael realizes Helene's age. I think she's 54, correct? 58. After some hard math by Michael. <laughs> so he realizes he's not robbing the cradle. He's robbing the grave. <laughs> and Pam, deservedly so, gets to punch Michael. Ends up being more of a hard smack. Yeah. Nice, nice slap to the face, which he limps away. <laughs> yeah. Why is he limping? <laughs> so 
So that's a short-lived relationship as a result of the wedding episode. Another relationship that we see start to stem from that wedding is Dwight's relationship with Isabel, Pam's sister. Yes. She's impressive. She's a dental hygienist from Carbondale. Unfortunately, she makes love like one. She's a bumpkin. I find out later on that Michael refers to Aaron as a rube, and I wasn't sure exactly what a rube was. I got the gist of it. But the definition that was given to me by Google was a country bumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. They don't like country bumpkins, apparently, out in Scranton. I just love that Michael, after a night next to the vending machine, goes into Dwight's room after he says goodbye to Isabel, and the room is tore up. And Michael's upset about this, and Dwight couldn't care less. He said he was up all night knocking boots. <laughs> it looks like somebody was up all night knocking boots or there was a murder there. One of the two. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And then when they're at breakfast, he's just mowing down the food and, and Michael in disgust. But Dwim, Dwight's response is, I'm ravenous after a night of lovemaking. And I quote this all the time <laughs> if I can. If I can insert this into a conversation, I will say I'm ravenous after a night of lovemaking. <laughs> it's a great line but the wedding this staff this crew this this these office employees just make life miserable from the crappy gifts they get them i think dwight gets some turtles and michael a self-portrait that he drew from memory <laughs> just phyllis gets a birdhouse yeah <laughs> they just wanted cash but in the end Pam and Jim just said, take off. They go to Niagara Falls, and they get on one of these boats that gets you really close to the falls. The Maid of the Mist. And Maid of the Mist, yes. And which I, I pondered as we were at Niagara Falls together. I remember staring out thinking, Jim and Pam got married down there. And I sent a text to my friend Amanda, and she is a big Office fan, but she is not enthused about our podcast. I don't understand what the hell's going on there. <laughs> well, we'll win her over one way or another. I'll start amping it up for her. They eventually get back to the chapel, which that chapel is located in California. That chapel is not actually in Niagara Falls, but that hotel that they stayed at is in Niagara Falls. So there's some fun facts for you. And as they walk down the aisle, Jim instinctively knew this based on a YouTube video where Jill and Kevin got married to Chris Brown's Forever Song. So they do this little dance down the aisle and one of the more memorable feel good, make me cry scenes of season six that's for sure and to cap it off one of my favorite lines is when jim says that the boat was plan c the church was plan b and plan a was marrying her a long long time ago yeah always gets me that that very photogenic scene with jim and pam and pam's laying on his shoulder just like she was in season one when she fell asleep it's the perfect bow really was good job jim and pam thank you <laughs> So moving on to our next favorite episode, the murder episode. Yeah, that relates to Dunder Mifflin going bankrupt. That's right. And in an attempt to take everybody's mind off of the impending bankruptcy, Michael distracts them with a murder mystery game, Bells, Bourbon, and Bullets. And the only reason he gets to pull this off is because Jim owes him one from Tube City. <laughs> it's Tube City with the, the hamsters. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if he was going to use them like carrier pigeons and send messages or if he just wanted hamsters running around all day. But that was the gist of Tube City. And since he didn't get to do it, he gets to pull off this stunt. I do declare <laughs> there's been a murder. I do declare. <laughs> you got to let the words spill out of your mouth like molasses. <laughs> That's better than Oscar's accent. Oscars is horrible. Is it on this plantation? <laughs> <laughs> now do the Swedish chef. I'm not familiar with that one. He lives on Sesame Street, dumbass. <laughs> Creed is not enjoying this game. No, he shows up late for work for whatever reason. And then when Michael points to him as the prime suspect as part of the game, he books it. He's out of there. Which we can only wonder what Creed is up to. He's probably murdered at least two people in the series so far. We find out later he's banged Meredith. <laughs> That's right. He has. And he forgot about it. Mm. 
I like the ending to this episode with the Mexican standoff or imaginary Mexican standoff in the conference room between Pam, Dwight, Andy, and Michael. So that's what a Mexican standoff is. A Mexican standoff is a situation in which no party has a winning outcome. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> there you go. That's your educational tidbit for this episode, everybody. Moving on to our next favorite episode from this season, Scott's Tots. Hey, Mr. Scott, what you going to do? What you going to do? Make a dreams come true. So Michael has promised a number of third graders college tuition if they graduate from high school. That was over 10 years ago, and it is time to collect. <laughs> I like that. Time to collect. <laughs> so, yeah, what turns out, Michael, of course, thought he was going to be a billionaire at this point in his life, but he is still a co-manager at Sabre, <laughs> so he's not doing well. Not well enough to pay for all these kids' college. so He got them laptop batteries, which I thought was a nice touch. It doesn't fix the wrong that he's committed, though. And even though Aaron tries to make him feel better by letting him know that their graduation rate is 35% higher than the rest of the schools, it's still pretty fucked up at the end of the day. <laughs> these kids' dreams are completely shattered. What I think is interesting about that conversation with Aaron is that he's very high on her and wants the best for her at Dunder Mifflin or Sabre, excuse me. And a few episodes later, he calls her a rube, as you were pointing out earlier, a country bumpkin. Yeah. And he thinks she's weird and doesn't want to go to lunch with her. Yeah. So I don't know what happened there, but there was a 180 on Aaron, which I should point out, we can see Aaron's underwear during the dancing scene at the Niagara Falls episode, and it's pink. And I watched that blowjob girl video, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think of Aaron now? She's, even as her role as Kimmy Schmidt, she's always had this ditzy sexiness to her. Yes. She seems to play a very similar character. And so... For anybody unfamiliar, go ahead and Google the blowjob girl in your spare time. So there it is. Yeah. And it came right up. But the second, don't click on the second link. Click on the first link. <laughs> Do not go to X hamster. That is Canadian porn. <laughs> <laughs> you know what other episode I like is the happy hour episode? Oh, yeah. Me too. Oscar sets that up, right? Yeah. Oscar is in charge. He's trying to bang Matt or Mark. He calls him Mark, but he knows what he's doing. But he tries to get Daryl to organize a happy hour with office and warehouse. And they go to some place that's like a Dave and Buster's, but it's not. For whatever reason, Oscar has lost his ability to play basketball. Or maybe he's just playing bad on purpose to get on to Matt's good side. That's right. A number of other things happen in this episode, though, that are noteworthy. We finally meet Hide from the warehouse, who is a former heart surgeon from Japan who had to flee. Number one. That's one. right. <laughs> Steady end. <laughs> so he had to flee after killing a Yakuza gang boss. Is that a Fast and Furious thing? The Yakuza's? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the Yakuza is a real gang in Japan. We also get to meet Date Mike. Nice to meet me. <laughs> he is a caricature of reality tv show dating yes and apparently he has learned more from the losers than he has from the winners <laughs> this results in him doing things like dancing on the pool table to try and impress the girl julie that pam has brought along to try to set michael up with he was doing just fine until he realized he was actually on a date then the manager of the restaurant gets involved donna she asks him to leave. He gets down. He apologizes. And the situation seems to be resolved until he goes over to the bar and tells Donna that she doesn't use enough razzle-dazzle when dealing with people. They hit it off discussing management literature. Michael's book is written 100% in his head, and it's called Somehow I Manage, and it features him shrugging his shoulders with his sleeves rolled up. This isn't the first time he's brought up Somehow I Manage. Really? No. There's been other times that he's brought it up. It's right up there with Lee Iacocca's book and 
She recommends Michael, Donna recommends that he reads it. And he says, read it. I own it, but I haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> in an effort and in, in an effort to set up a date with Michael, she fishes out his business card from the free lunch bowl, sifting past yep. several Stanley Hudson cards to Stanley's disgust. <laughs> <laughs> and we think Stanley is there with other women. We're not sure who. Yeah, you said that the other night. I have to go back and see who that woman is. I got to see if it's Cynthia because you're convinced that it's not his wife and I wasn't even paying attention. Just like I didn't notice Creed lurking over Andy and Kevin's shoulder at the wedding scene. Did not notice that. I only happened to notice that just because I paused the screen at that exact moment and it was hilarious. <laughs> So Julie ends up leaving because she sees that Michael is hitting it off with another woman. And that's the end of that. Mike's on to the next one. Date Mike. And he actually gets, he has a short run with this, but it turns out Donna's just cheating with Michael on her husband. So, so he's a mistress. I love that in their effort to expose him cheating, Pam and Jim invite him over for dinner. <laughs> and he declines <laughs> <laughs> that's how they find out and he has been cheating yes so yeah i think that was a good run good couple series of episodes and i think that encapsulates the season six for sure yeah so let's get into some of our favorite quotes then let's do it there is the mafia episode which personally i think is one of the worst episodes ever but there is a classic scene that's reminiscent a la godfather where they think this salesperson is a member of the mob and that there might be a gun behind the toilet seat. So <laughs> Dwight checks it out only to discover a roach motel, which he brings back to the table and dumps it on the table. So all these dead roaches go and Andy freaks out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, then, and then shortly after, Michael proceeds to order the gabagool. <laughs> so yeah, I guess it's not too terrible of an episode. Another one of my favorite quotes is from the Secret Santa, <laughs> where Michael calls Phyllis Tranny Claus. <laughs> because you can't say tranny. And this was in 2009, 2010. So that was that is completely out of bounds now. I don't think you could say tranny at all. It is not a kosher term whatsoever. But for me, I'm watching this. I think it's funny because I know the intent and... I think it's, I think it's a funny quote. So, but I think Michael backs it all up because he turns into Jesus Christ a second later, <laughs> <laughs> as he's proceeding to make things worse. And what does he say at that moment? <laughs> <laughs> well, you need help because I am ruining everything. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> So at that moment, he does acknowledge that he is fucking everything up. <laughs> oh, my God. That is great. And Creed has some good moments this season, too, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't give an F about nothing. <laughs> What's that in reference to? It's when Michael doesn't give a shit about anything anymore. He's going around the office just doing whatever the fuck he wants. He's eating other people's food. Which yeah. He's done a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. I like how I think he eats Meredith's birthday cake. Yes. And then there's a scene where he's also eating olives and mayonnaise and he keeps eating it. <laughs> and Pam and Jim are like, stop it. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, this is awful. <laughs> it's like, why? Why did he come up with this concoction in the first place? Not to mention he drinks milk and sugar in the morning, like we hit on last season. This guy's yeah. diet is so fucked up. It's worse than mine. They eat a lot of pizza, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Their diet compared to yours, I think yours is actually better. Probably. All they eat is pizza and cake. And gabagool. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what are some other Creed moments that you love? Another moment from Creed that I like this season is when Pam tries to get out of the double lunch date with Jim, Michael, and his mom. She fakes a shipping emergency, and Jim comes over and verifies that everything got there just fine. 
And Creed <laughs> breathes a sigh of relief. But then when they go to the side interview, he says, something's up. That delivery never should have arrived. <laughs> uh, the context for these quotes. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Oh, I love it. He also says something about having a worm guy. You're paying too much for yeah. worms. <laughs> and Dwight has a shirt guy in New York. I have an air conditioning guy. I guess everybody's got a guy for something. Those just seem really obscure items to have a guy for. Michael has a, how do I say this, homosexual guy that he asks advice <laughs> for <laughs> upon getting his colonoscopy. He wants to know if there's right. anything that he can do to make it more pleasurable for himself or the doctor. <laughs> That's during one of my favorite opening segments. And Oscar is just floored. He's also approached by Andy in the first episode of this season when Andy isn't sure if he's gay or not. And Oscar says that this responsibility can't possibly fall to him. <laughs> For opening segments, I'm a fan of parkour. 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 <laughs> Gainer. Gainer. <laughs> Andy just jumping right into the box <laughs> is the perfect <laughs> way to end that segment. Because you, you just there's a moment of silence where you don't know if he's dead. <laughs> but it sounds like he's just really hurt. I'm also a big fan of Recyclops, which is Dwight as a hippie in sandals and a handkerchief around his head. It slowly Which evolves. Evolves, yeah. <laughs> it slowly <laughs> turns into a robot. Which I think Recyclops is a great Halloween idea. This year I'm going to be Bob Ross. I don't know what you're going to be. I've got a big box. Yes, I do. I got a big box. How about you? Scissor me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Aaron's just hurling scissors around the office at Michael's request and Pam being a new mom is absolutely mortified especially since he catches them blades open yep he's good <laughs> too good for his own good sometimes cameos there's a couple this season I find it interesting that Nick the IT guy played by Nelson Franklin was seen in a previous season at the job fair. I completely forgot about that. So that was a little eye-opening to me. And that almost made him my candidate for this season. But I got to go with David Costabao, who plays the banker that comes to visit Dunder Mifflin. Some people might recognize him as Gale from Breaking Bad. And for that right. role alone, that's why he is my candidate for this season. Breaking Bad was such a great series. I think you like it as well. It's a classic, and his role in that series is pretty comedic, comes to a little bit of a sad ending, and I appreciated seeing him in The Office as well, just because I liked that show that much. Christian Slater makes a cameo in the Saber video <laughs> that makes no sense. No. makes no sense whatsoever. Like it, it just shows up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he has no title, too. He's just like, I'm Christian Slater. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching this I mean, uh, saber you know it's just it's uh and everybody some people get excited other people are just you know michael's of course is excited but i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna go not only am i nominating but i'm bestowing the honor to sarah baker she plays the nurse in the delivery episode she's got a funny few lines where she notes that Pim and Jam. Pim and, Pim and Jam? <laughs> <laughs> jam and Pim. Jam, Jan. <laughs> Jim and Pam. There it is. <laughs> You're leaving that in there. You're so leaving that in there. <laughs> but no, she's just got some great lines where... They think they've read all these baby books and she's like, okay, yeah, so you're an expert. But she's just, she's just good. And she was also in an episode of Louie, the Louis C.K. show. And she, there was, it was a very serious about dating fat girls, I think was the content. But, ah, uh, edgy because Louis C.K. did something edgy every time. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's, he's been disgraced because he masturbated in front of women. But, you know, no different than Jeffrey Tubin did recently on a Zoom call. But whatever. Either way, <laughs> I love Sarah Baker. I love her delivery. I love her voice. I love everything about her. So she's my favorite. Gotcha. He's a good one. Pim and Jam. Pim and Jam. <laughs> I think the only other one that I could even mention is Joey, 
from Twister. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forget what his last name is. Joey Slipknot. <laughs> <laughs> I was on IMDb trying to find this guy. No clue. <laughs> Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off was in Twister. I did not know that. You didn't know that? It's because you haven't seen Twister. You need to go and watch Twister. It's a great movie. It's a crappy movie. Why would I waste my time? There's so it got many two Academy Award watching. nominations. I could be watching Social Dilemma again. Did you watch it once? No, I didn't. I, I lived it. I'm living it right now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so don't say again. I'm going to keep riding you until you fucking watch that. Okay. Yeah, so Twister or Social Dilemma? Take your pick, buddy. <laughs> You've got time for both. Don't give me that shit. <laughs> Is there anything else that you wanted to hit on before we wrap up this episode? Kelly being topless. You showed me this the other night, and I my mind was blown. <laughs> <laughs> when Ryan was taking photographs on exposure yes. in the workplace? Yeah. Turns out Nick wasn't a big fan of Ryan's photography. <laughs> your, your art sucks, man. You're not a photographer. <laughs> Speaking of art, Pam's painting is gone at a point early on in the season. It's It gets returned, but at some point okay. there's just a generic golf motivational poster there. Okay. So that's one thing that I noticed. I know Kathy Bates who makes a special guest appearance as Joe Bennett, the CEO of Sabre, she puts something on Pam's painting or drawing. That's correct. That's when I noticed that it yeah. was back. Gotcha. And the only other thing that I noticed from this season that carries over is Ryan's relocation in the office. And that's where he creates Wolf. I think he innovates there in that janitor closet. Jim puts him there to punish him, but it turns out that he comes up with his best idea yet. <laughs> Woof.com. <laughs> Woof. So I think that about wraps it up for this season, unless there's anything else you wanted to hit on before we go. I feel we've covered it all. Yes, we did miss something. What's that? Angela and Dwight's baby contract. Ooh, that's right. They end up notarizing it at Jim and Pam's, ironically. I thought they were going <laughs> to do it there. But... Dwight and Angela enter into a contract to conceive a child. And this is because Dwight wants to use the baby to boost his sales. And then Angela later uses the contract to keep him in a relationship, more or less, against Isabel. Who disappears after season six? That's right. She pretty much just drops off the face of the earth. She might make a cameo later on, but Dwight courting her completely stops. That was another one of your favorite moments in Date Night. In happy hour episode. Yeah, that's right. When Angela sneaks up behind him and Dwight yells, F <laughs> I think it's actually funnier when it's bleeped out. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of like South Park. I find it funnier when the kids are bleeped out as opposed to them being uncensored. We all know what the, they're saying. It's just funnier. Yeah. <laughs> so is there anything else? I also prefer. No, no, no. That, that, that is all. I think we've, We've definitely, that is season six, and, but I, I wanted to make sure we, we hit on some of those other things as we get into season seven. Thank you for the reminder. And if there's anything else that we may have missed, you can let us know on Twitter at CTS Terry or by searching the Catch the Sky podcast on Facebook or Instagram. You may listen to us on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts these days. Be sure to subscribe and share with your friends. Until next week, keep trying to catch the sky. <laughs>